Uh, I shouldn't generalize, but uh, one of the conclusions that, I, that I've come to and one of the things that I've said frequently is that um, maybe this terrible economy that we're living in, in, in right now, much of which is blamed on our friends on, on Wall Street, and many of them are my friends, um, uh, had to do with leadership and management. Really think about it. Many of these CEOs who are incredibly imperious and powerful and also incredibly high paid into the hundreds of millions a year, some of them, um, really thought they were God. And uh, they thought they knew it all. And, uh, and there were books, all, uh, books are starting to come out now. For example, William Cohan's book, House of Cards, A Tale of Hubris and Wretched Excesses on Wall Street. Um, and, uh, and points out that a lot of these bosses were imperious. And they were even later uh, uh, in, uh, testifying in Congress. And a couple of them said, well, I, we didn't know that was happen happening. And I think they were probably sincere. They didn't know the wheels were coming off the company, even though probably their workers did. And why didn't they know? One, they were imperious bosses, and uh, they, uh, uh, their employees were either afraid to tell them the truth, or they didn't tell them the truth uh, because they knew all, the only thing they wanted to hear was what they wanted to hear. Hence, the companies themselves uh, took all of America's economy down with it. A lot of the models that have been generated over the years about bosses, about leadership, perhaps too are to blame uh, from my industry, my industry meaning the uh, media industry, uh, the, the movie industry, John, you know, uh, films like uh, The Devil Wears Prada, uh, Wa uh, Wall Street, uh, a really nasty one, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Swimming with the Shark, Citizen Kane, um, the, uh, 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 the Donald Trump uh, TV show, uh, The Apprentice, You're Fired, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, so the media itself, you know, many people, myself included, get Peter principled up to these very powerful and important jobs. And uh, you don't really have any role models to speak of, particularly if you've had uh, a bad boss ahead of you. So what do you do? You, le you, you, know, you look at the movies and you say, this is the way we have to lead. I've got to be a killer. Well, it turns out being a killer is a disaster. Um, what we mean by a kind boss, uh, we don't mean weak. And I'll talk about some of the things we don't mean in a second. But there are several factors that uh, Michael O'Malley and I isolated. One is compassion, realizing that the individuals who uh, work for you are not just people who fit into some kind of cog in a machine. They're human beings. They come to you with unique and, uh, and, uh, and, and unique experiences from their previous jobs. They come to you as, uh, as people who have families and problems and wonderful skills that may not even be related to the job. I never forgot um, uh, at public television in New York, there were two, um, there were two very interesting uh, stories. One, uh, my, one of our lawyers uh, who had, had been hired, uh, I asked him to help me. I thought he was a, just a bright guy and loved the TV business but had no experience. He was a very good lawyer, but no experience in the television business. I said, I'm going to produce this TV show about the history of New York television. Would you help me with it? Well, he wound up producing it and won the Emmy Award. Uh, actually, I, I won the Emmy Award, but he did the work. So, uh, you know, so, and, and there are, uh, you know, there, there are ex executive assistants. That we, uh, I've had a number over the years who've gone on to, you know, uh, you, you know a, a, a couple of them have always been smarter than I am, uh, like my wife, and had, had gone on to major jobs in the, uh, in the television business because we realized really they had skills beyond um, uh, some, of the, uh, some, of the, some of the job descriptions that they had. Now, integrity is another factor, and whenever we mention that, that of course seems to be uh, an obvious, you know, integrity. Everybody, uh, everybody knows you have to be. But I don't mean don't be like Madoff. You know, I mean we all know that we shouldn't do. But there's something about always being able. The employees are always able to spot a phony. So many companies, so many, you know, big and small, have these uh, have all of these policies that make it look like where they pretend they're trying to be nice to their employees, but the employees really know. This is a bunch of BS. And uh, it, it jumps out to the employees, but somehow the uh, executives think that, uh, oh, they're doing all the right things. Well, a lot of that is kind of false integrity. Um, the other thing, and the thing that I learned most of all was uh, gratitude. Um, uh, all of us who have had uh, long and successful careers, or even short and successful careers, 
always have had them as a result of standing on other people's shoulders. I've been particularly uh, uh, unique in that area, and, and I am particularly grateful. Uh, early on, when I got my biggest job in my career, which was president of Westinghouse Television, I had seven, I was 38 years old, I had 7,000 employees, and you know, a, a huge worldwide operation. And um, I had only run uh, a television station and production company in Hollywood before that, which were relatively small businesses compared to this big thing. So I got sick, I got pneumonia, and I realized, my gosh, you know, I don't have a clue as to how to really run this place. Uh, and I had been blessed because I had a boss that was just wonderful. He's a man who's still alive, Dan Ritchie, who later became president of the University of Denver, an incredible luminary, uh, who was also a visionary. And I wound up hiring people who were only in their 60s to be my uh, 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 presidents of the divisions that reported to me, and they ultimately were the, uh, were the ones that saved my life. Um, authenticity. How many of you in this room have ever heard of a 360? Have you ever taken those? 360s are psychological tools. A lot of businesses use them, uh, where you have uh, where you have everybody who reports to you uh, answer kind of a questionnaire, and everybody who's your uh, members of your family, uh, people from all sides of you, the people who report to you, the people that you report to your family and your friends all, uh, I think Alan Glazen uh, took mine a bunch of years ago. It's a very scary thing to have. And you think, well, I have, um, uh, I have some secrets that only uh, my family knows about, you know. But if you wind up after you get the results, and the results are supposed to be only confidential, only to you, that, um, that really everybody knows all your secrets. Your employees know, you, you know, your, it's not just your family, it's your friend. Everybody knows about these little secrets that you thought were, uh, uh, that only you had. So being authentic, to be, being open, realizing that you're only a human being, especially if, if you have a job of great leadership, and being humble about it is, um, is really critical. One of the great leaders in America, there are numbers of them right now, and by the way, in, in the current US News and World Report, I guess, they have they just published a list of some of the what they view as the as the top leaders. Um, one of the things I've always felt is that some of the very finest leaders that I've ever met are people with incredible humility. Uh, so uh, what's what's a, a, a boss a kind what is not what a kind boss is not a kind boss is not the terms really basically are a kind boss is firm and fair. But it doesn't mean the kind boss is weak or a doormat or indecisive or, you know, I, I never forgot giving a lecture uh, to a bunch of uh, Phi Beta Kappa people uh, at a university in New York and they said, well, you mean if, if you're just nice, you're going to do really well? I said, no, of course not. You know, I mean, you really have to be competent as a leader too. You know, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have a vision. You have to be strong. You have to tell people, you have to be ready to fire people. You have to be able to f find the best people to do the job. So you have to be firm and you have to be fair. But uh, so you're not, uh, you're not as, as Gandhi said, don't mistake, my, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. And I think that's, uh, you know, really an important quote. Uh, there's a lot of corroboration of this, uh, of this thesis. You know, this is not, uh, when I came here, even though this is a pledge week at public television in Cleveland, uh, you know, this is not a pledge show. This is not one of the, you know, this is not, not that all pledge shows are soft, but this is not a soft, got to be careful what I'm saying around here, uh, but this is not one of those uh, kinds of things. This, this, this subject is, is well corroborated. Uh, the Harvard Business uh, uh, Review did a, uh, an interesting article called The Uncompromising Leaders. Leaders of high commitment, high performance organizations refuse to choose between people and profits. And they list some of the top companies in their opinion. These are a bunch of academics who are worldwide academics. Uh, and they include companies like Becton, Dickinson, Ikea, Quest, Timken, Timken here uh, in Ohio. Um, the, other, uh, uh, the other one, and one of the most interesting studies that just popped out, again, uh, reported a few months ago in the Harvard Business Review, and this one I'd really like to drill into, called, uh, this was a, a report done by biologists, biologists, social, and, the, and the, the article was titled Social Intelligence and the Biology of Leadership. 